<laughs> so super kind. Thank you all for coming. And uh, so you find out strange things when you're putting together a nerd convention, a geek convention, a celebration of our culture. You find out that the uh, Guinness World Record holder for Swamp Thing Collection lives right here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. <laughs> and uh, just a, a wonderful John, wonderful guy. He's such a driving force in Sioux Falls in local music. And in, he's, a, he's an advocate for the town. And um, he was one of the earliest ones to sign up for us. And, and it means a lot for us to have this and for to have Mr. Phil Hester here who had a beautiful run on Swamp Thing and along with many other accomplishments. And to have them talk about this quirky, wonderful character that has touched their lives, and and it's going to be a pleasure for all of us. So, you know, welcome, Mr. John Moylan and Mr. Phil Hester. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, being here today. This is a uh, really exciting. Uh, so, uh, about 13 months ago, I decided to do something really goofy and uh, write or fill out an application on the Guinness World Records website and uh, for the largest Swamp Thing collection. And they emailed me three weeks later and said, you're good to go. Like, here's your paperwork, get started. And um, so I just decided to go for it. Um, to get a Guinness World Record, uh, you have to go through a ton of paperwork and you have to hold a, uh, an event, a public event. All of the items have to be reviewed um, have to be checked off, meticulously reviewed. It's kind of ridiculous. And Phil was gracious enough to, to drive up from uh, his home in Iowa to review the collection. And uh, he reviewed the collection, took like, I think, four hours to review everything. And then he got right back in his car and went back home and worked. Uh, I think that was a flash comic. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, so the guy is super talented, worked really hard, and is ridiculously gracious. Um, so thank you for, for being here. Um, <laughs> So a question I get a lot um, is, uh, is why Swamp Thing? Um, and I answer that question a ton, uh, but I know that Phil is uh, a fan of Swamp Thing as well, obviously, while working on, what, 30 plus books? Mm -hmm. Or 30 books. Um, so uh, I guess my question for you is why do you appreciate Swamp Thing? Um, well, as I, I know a lot of you were at the other panels I did today earlier, and I think previously I uh, made clear that I like weird superheroes, and the weirder the better, and it's one thing sort of the granddaddy of them all, as far as a, a weird kind of horror-oriented superhero. And my own style sort of blends to that um, sort of blend of comic exaggeration and kind of dark gothic, you know, um, heavy blacks that you might find in Swamp Thing comics, especially in Freddy Wright's and Thrive. So aesthetically, I was drawn to Swamp Thing, and then just thematically, the weirdness of it also pulled me in. And of course, it doesn't hurt that those first 10 issues are really excellent comic books, you know. And um, so they're, they're, Swamp Thing's just been evergreen, and it's been lucky that like subsequent runs you know, there'll be down runs here and there, but every three or four years, there's another excellent run of Swamp Thing. So yeah, if you like good comics and you like weird comics, you can't not like Swamp Thing. Yeah. I, uh, so uh, through my Swamp Thing research, I collect articles, um, just the goofiest stuff. If you haven't had a chance to look at my uh, exhibit downstairs, please do so. Um, in my research, uh, I came across a few quotes that I thought were pretty awesome. Uh, one is by Wes Craven, and one is by um, a writer from uh, Famous Monsters magazine from 1982. Um, the first quote is from Famous Monsters number 183, and uh, they're describing uh, Swamp Thing and uh, the passion and why, uh, what's so appealing about him. And to go along with what uh, Phil was saying is, uh, this gentleman wrote, uh, there's a message of hope um, that despite incredible adversity and personal tragedy, someone can triumph. It's the spirit of the lonely outsider, the man or woman who is forced by nature or circumstances to be on the outside, to be alone and watch life go on around them. So Swamp Thing being uh, started as Alec Holland, uh, a human, a scientist. Um, there was a lab explosion, some thugs blew up his lab. The chemicals he was working on 
got mixed with him in the explosion. His uh, dead body lied in the swamp and he merged with the plant life. So that's kind of a very rough uh, uh, origin story there. Um, another great quote by uh, Wes Craven was, uh, he's sort of the green James Dean. <laughs> totally. Uh, an outsider you can identify with. Uh, he said, I think there's a part of all of us that nobody can relate to, the real us, and that we're sort of creepazoids, just wandering around in the world uh, of our own making. Inside this monster, uh, there's a beautiful person. He, uh, he knows it's there, but which he can't convey to anybody else. So, to go along with that, he's such a wonderful character that he's not a superhero. He's not looking to save the day. He stumbles into these things, and uh, just being a good person, he chooses to make the right decision. He chooses to do uh, the good thing, and that's what makes it so wonderful. One, you know, a one single comic could just have a, his basically personal growth, and you can just get into that, and and uh, it, it's very involving, it's well written. Um, and the great thing too is, even when it's not well written, it usually looks amazing. Yeah. They always have, <laughs> yeah, there's always such great creative themes. I feel like for a character that isn't as popular as all the others, he has two TV shows, two movies, he has a ridiculous amount of merchandise for such a small character. Um, so it, it's just another aspect of the <laughs> small thing that's, uh, that's quite interesting. Um, uh, so, and another question uh, to Phil. So, along with that, uh, two movies, two TV shows. Um, that's more than really any B-level comic character. And at one point, he had more uh, multimedia than even Batman. Um, why do you think Swamp Thing has such longevity, or he keeps coming back? Uh, I all I know is from like a creative perspective. Um, so many comic book artists and writers grew up as fans of Swamp Thing, and everyone sort of can't wait to get their hands on the character. That at up at DC they get bombarded with Swamp Thing pitches, even while there's a Swamp Thing book going on, they'll get a pitch for another take on it because everybody wants to try their hand at Swamp Thing. So that's sort of uh, I don't I don't know if there's always a public clamor for it. But there's on the creative side, there's always there are always teams ready to jump in and do their their part to like sort of revive Swamp Thing. And I don't know, there might there probably is some kind of deep seated Jungian, you know, subconscious identification with that primal monster because um, you know Swamp Thing comes from a long tradition of swamp creatures. I mean, there there's any number of uh, swamp monsters in and out of comics, but on the Marvel side of things, Man Thing uh, being the prime example. But you know, you know as well as I do, there's like scores of swamp creatures. So it, it's a, it's a, a definitely something existing in the human subconscious that Swamp Thing taps into probably best. Um, did you enjoy the movies uh, when they came out? Well, <laughs> listen. <laughs> When the first one came out, I was in high school. And it's not like it is today, where like you guys are spoiled by all the awesome superhero, horror, fantasy, science fiction movies. Like when Swan Thing came out, we had to appreciate it because that was it. You know, like we had to like go get behind it because that's all that was coming out. And to be honest, it was kind of cool just to see these ideas that were previously just part of our little nerd clubhouse to see them. On wider display, so yeah, I do. I did appreciate the first movie. Plus, I had Adrian Barbo in it, and, <laughs> and I was thirteen, you know, so it was important. Uh, but it, it was it, no, I, I I did like it, and I liked the Nick Rock outfit. You know, you could tell it was a rubber suit, but it was still it still looked cool. And you know, just to see one thing on the big screen was exciting to me. Um, overall, I feel that uh, your run on Swamp Thing with uh, Millar, Morrison, and DeMolder uh, is overrated, but it's such a great series. Um, there are numerous uh, great character tie-ins as well um, as a return to more of like a horror feel, uh, which I'm sure helps that it was on Vertigo. Yeah. Um, 
When you were on the book, how much of uh, how much of your appreciation for the character influenced your choices? In oh, yeah. Well, when I was drawing it, I was I was trying to steer it back toward Wrightson, and even though I I'm like friends with Bissett and and Toddlebit and those guys, I met those guys. Um, I felt like it was getting away from that original monstrous, you know, misshapen human being and getting more like plenty and a little more psychedelic. And I wanted to get back to that sort of. What I liked about the original run was like he, he was mad about being in this body that was clumsy, you know. And um, I what we want I wanted to get back to making him a monster again instead of a green god, you know, and him to be a monster. And and this is gonna sound so insider and weird, but like he was getting too plant-like, and I wanted him to be more mud-like. Yeah. So I wanted him to be a little more solid and goopy and. Yeah, and but unfortunately, my inker was under orders from DC to like make it look like John Toddleman had never left the book. So it it, it, be, it I was penciling in like I was trying to be Bernie Wrightson, and he was inking it like he was trying to be John Toddleman. So we were at cross purposes a lot of the time. Uh, do you have a favorite issue from uh, your time? From my time, yeah. I like to forget my time <laughs> along with everybody else. But um, I probably, well, that's really tough to say. Um, probably the anniversary issue 150, I really like that one. Yeah, that was fun. And I have dis very distinct memories of my time drawing it at that point. So, yeah, that's my favorite issue. That's, that's and Sarge on the Sarge Serena, too. Which is, I like Are there any, I guess, like insider baseball stories that you can, like, and obviously I'm sure there's plenty of, like, all of I'm our sure jobs. you want to direct me towards them. No, 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 actually, we'll get there. I, I have a little, a little game we're going to play after this. Um, but I guess, I, I just mean, like, maybe some, like, surface level stuff or some little insider stuff that maybe we don't know about. Yeah, sure. I mean, <laughs> I, I, one thing is that when, the, at the time the book got canceled, uh, when we can't, it was canceled for low sales at a time when like the numbers on that book would make it the, the by far the best selling vertigo book right now. Yeah, I mean it, I think they canceled it was selling like thirty one thousand, which nowadays would be a smash shit of vertigo. Um, but you know, DC had different priorities at that time. But no, I uh, and a little insider thing for me on how I got the assignment. That's okay, I got a little, good little story. There. <laughs> um, I was asked to try out for the book, and like I said, I, I've been a fan of that book since I was like 11 years old, and so it was it was like being asked to try out for your favorite baseball team you grew up loving. And I did three sample pages, and I thought they were really good, and I sent them in, and I didn't get the assignment, and. I was really down about it. And at the time, there was an Albert Brooks movie that just came out called Defending Your Life. Has anybody seen that movie? Really? And it was, a, it was about like not living with regret. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to call them up and ask to do my samples again. Like, I'm going to ask for another shot. And I called them and they said, okay, well, I don't know how much has changed between now and three weeks ago when you submitted these. But, you could do another set of samples if you want. And I did. And they weren't a ton better, but they were a little better. And also, here's what I did. And, and I thought, well, and they hired me. And I thought, wow, it worked. What I didn't know was they actually had hired somebody else, and he had flaked in that three weeks and disappeared on him and not done a single page in the three weeks that they hired him. So it was a good thing I, I knocked on the door again. Uh, and it, and the artist's name was Billy Oscar, who's passed away now. But um, uh, yeah, I'm glad he played. <laughs> uh, I truly appreciate the detail and the craftsmanship that goes into uh, drawing Swamp Thing. And every artist that has ever worked on it puts their own spin on it. Um, but at the same time, when I look at the detail and the time that goes into drawing Swamp Thing, is it kind of like a blessing and a curse at the same time? Yeah. 
It's not a curse at all because it's a, it's almost like like if, I don't know how many of you are artists or you know even for yourself as a hobby or you're musicians or whatever. But you know when you really get into something and you feel like you're in the groove and you're just sort of like you're jamming on the thing. Um, Swamp Thing is the ultimate jam character because you just get in there and improvise because he's you know he's misshapen and he's a monster and he's made of moss and mud and luck so you can sort of just like if he if he's not consistent from panel to panel it's not a big deal um and if he's exaggerated i mean look at the kelly jones room for how exaggerated he could become so you can just sort of jam consistently throughout so it's it's not a it's not a pain in the neck at all. It's actually a lot of fun all the way through. And um, even to this day, if somebody comes up to me with a sketchbook and says, draw whatever you want, like probably seven times out of 10, I'll do Swamp Thing. That's awesome. <laughs> do you keep up with the book even today? Or do you have, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, it's still great. How do you like the new series? Yeah. But you mean the, the brand brand new and the Len yeah. Wayne Kelly Jones one? Yeah. yeah, I really like it. I mean, it, I but I like the one before it too. Oh. But it's nice to see this new one be kind of a throwback to that original run, especially to see Kelly kind of approximate that kind of broad rights and feel to the book. Yeah, it's neat. I, uh, I always get a little bit uh, aggravated when people get really hung up on continuity and if something isn't exactly the same. And with social media being uh, so pervasive, everyone's voice is out there. It seems like you can hear a lot of negative stuff like, oh, well, they're not sticking to the plan or how he looks or whatnot. Um, and I've heard a lot of classic Swamp Thing fans say they do not like the New 52 because they turn him into a superhero more right. than just being a monster. Um, did you enjoy the New 52 series? Yeah. Uh, I have to say I'm a mark for pretty much every, I'm like you, John, I'm a mark for every, every iteration of Swamp Thing. I mean, I even like the end of the first run when he, really was a, kind of a superhero. I mean, they changed his logo to look like a superhero yeah. logo. Um, yeah, no, I. he's just such a bulletproof concept that you can put him through the ringer. He's sort of like Batman. You can put him through so many different takes, and he's still recognizable. The essence of the character still comes through. So yeah, I, I like all of them. And as long as there's talent on the book, I, like you said, in the times when it's not well written, it's usually well drawn. Yeah. And when it's not well drawn, it's usually well written. And but a lot of the times it's both. And when it's both, it's it's really magical. Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to play a little game. Um, and maybe this will be the first annual. Uh, uh, Phil, what were you thinking? Well, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> so let's see. Well, first of all, not what were you thinking? I just want to say thank you for doing this. Um, so here's just some panels. Uh, last week I went through all of Phil's uh, books and I took a few photos of each one and uh, we're going to go through and just see what he was thinking uh, on some of these panels. Um, these are some of, some of my favorites. Uh, the great thing about Phil's run is what he made the character do. Like He brought his abilities back. Uh, I feel like there's too many uh, books where they don't utilize his abilities. He can almost flow like water by manipulating um, organic material. Uh, he can move in the blink of an eye across a field through any organic material. It's just really impressive. Um, during Phil's run, uh, he was, he, uh, excuse me, he drew characters, classic characters, uh, such as Liz Tremaine, that you'll uh, recognize from series one and uh, some of series two, uh, Taffy, uh, Abby, and Swamp Thing, and Constantine's kid. Uh, which gets weird. Uh, Dr. Fate, Matt Cable, Matt the Raven, Linda Holland, Batman, Dead Man, Phantom Stranger, Spectre, Lady Jane, Arcane, Sargon, Zatara, Constantine, Chaz, Solomon Grundy, Killer Croc, Chester Williams, one of my favorites, and uh, the Floronic Man. So in these 30 books, he just packed in so much great stuff. Um, so this is just to get us started here. And this is the first one. So, <laughs> all right. Okay. So, I do have things to tell you about. Okay. So, just to start things off, this is what I call the music slide. So, on the T-shirt, you're going to see uh, Platt's angst. Uh, it's like a music, uh, noise music, or like more of an artsy. Yeah. 
Uh, Plot Zones is a one-man band of really kind of impenetrable arc noise, and it's it's it, it's actually the name of it's a pseudonym for my a guy I knew in college named Colin Wales, who was a who was a comic book artist and. Um, Plot Zanks actually got some buzz from Warren Ellis. Warren Ellis um, kind of kept those uh, those discs on his on his blog. But not only is that his band, that's him. That's Colin. That's a guy I knew in college. I, I, I just went ahead and put him in the book. Yeah. And then um, and then the other one is you. You want to say that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, this ancient, this um, Amazonian shaman is wearing a fishbone t-shirt. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was really into fishbone then. <laughs> I still like fishbone. I was like really into fishbone then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, slide number two. Phil, what were you thinking? Um, here are just two examples of, in, I'm not sure of last year, but uh, I think maybe Phil representing his Iowa uh, roots. Yeah. So I see Swamp Thing's hand is right over the map, uh, kind of in your neck of the woods. And then also the sheriff's car says Iowa County. Yeah. Um, I live in Iowa County. So Iowa County, Iowa. And and actually Swamp Thing's kind of his middle finger is sort of over <laughs> where I live. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was actually a little bit of synergy between Mark and I, because Mark, um, he really wanted to do something that related to the Mississippi River, and he knew I lived on the river. So, no, I'm not quite on the river. I'm like 90 minutes from the Mississippi, but close enough. And um, so he wanted to tap into like my knowledge of, of basically Middle America. And so yeah, that's where the river run, the whole, that whole run came from. All right, next slide. Okay. I absolutely love this panel on the right hand side because if you're familiar with this uh, run, Swamp Thing uh, gains the powers of the Parliament of Vapor, uh, the Parliament of Waves, the Parliament of Stone, and on the bottom right hand side, Swamp Thing has utilized his power of the, the waves to put out a fire and he is cannonballing. These are little cannonballing Swamp Things. Um, is there any, any background behind little cannonballs? Um, not really. We just really want to mean, I just thought it would be cool if, instead of just showing raindrops that you actually showed he was inhabiting each and every last little raindrop. So I made little fetal water swamp things to go in him. It was like really blown up huge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, that, that was my that was one of my favorite parts was to draw not just swamp thing but like rock thing and you know just see him take on all those different different forms. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay. Do you see what sticks out? Okay. okay. So Phil let me in on some, some awesome little trivia. This one thing never has a left ear. And 99% of the books, he does not have a left ear. Right. He will have a right ear, but when you see the left side of him, it's just not there. So, yeah, that's, yeah, that's just something I noticed from like, doing the book is that like he only has one ear and I, I mean from reading the book and I decided to keep it up but a lot of artists don't you know you know from being a Swamp Thing collector that a lot of people are going with both ears and I you know I just tried it that was sort of my homage to the rice and run where you only have one when I came across this I freaked out I was like oh my god Phil drew a left ear yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I honestly think it's because I had that um, panel going the other way before, and I flipped it. Nice. So, <laughs> false alarm. It is a right ear turn to the left. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. So, going through the panels again, there was this uh, reoccurring item that kept jumping out at me, which I thought was really funny. So, on the top left, uh, you're going to see a phone booth in the graffiti. It says Green Weenie. And then uh, down here, you can see La Weenie Verde. <laughs> and then on the right hand side, I think it says The Book of Green Weenie. Hold on. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so um, I, I know you mentioned it uh, before we started, but what's the deal with Green Weenie? Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you exactly what this is. I, I have nothing to do with this Green Weenie business. <laughs> 
that is all the anger. The anger came them over. That's his idea. I I think what happened. This the one on the left is an earlier issue, and at the time I was like a, uh, a big fan of Ween, the band Ween, and so I was putting Ween graffiti on a lot of in a lot of books I was doing, and I think he riffed on that and turned that into green weenie and then just kept it up and just kept doing it inserting it into the book over and over again so i think i think that's the genesis of it honestly but you'll have to you'll have to get kim de to come to sioux falls and explain it to you that uh, quote is going to live in my brain for a very long time well esther i have nothing to do with this green weenie yeah. business <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, next up, uh, let's see. This is from issue 146, mm -hmm. and it is uh, a House of Secrets oh, number yeah. 92 reference. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's a direct homage to that, that classic House of Secrets cover, and, except for it's, you know, all messed up. <laughs> but, um, and that the fact that it's an homage is kind of brought home by the fact that I put BW Essence and the on the perfume bottle, which stands for Party Rights. Um, but yeah, and you, you know the secret, you know the story behind that House of Secrets cover, who that is on there? Uh, I forget her name, but I've seen the photos, the reference. Yeah, the it's pretty cool. It's, uh, I think it's Louise Simonson. Yes. It's Wheezy Simonson. Yeah. yeah, the wife of Walt Simonson. She's, she's the star of that House of Secrets cover. Okay, let's see. But she wasn't Weezy Simonson yet. No. <laughs> okay. Um, Phil, what's the importance of, of okay. this? Is so <laughs> so inside baseball. But um, Karen Berger, do you guys know who Karen Berger is? She's the executive editor of Vertigo. Yeah. Yeah. And now she edits it. She packages books for Image. But she and Mark Miller kind of didn't really see eye to eye about the book. Mark kept wanting to put superheroes in the book and um, kept wanting to put like Superman and Batman in the book and Karen forbade it. Um, and so they were they were in kind of like a kind of a feud, like a low, like an almost submerged feud, like where they were never it was totally passive aggressive on everybody's part. <laughs> and but Karen always saw herself as um, as Abby. In the book, she that was sort of her, and she also had long flowing hair. And Mark is sort of kind of like a kind of a petty thing, <laughs> kind of a petty thing. Cut Abby's hair in the book, and a, knowing that it would piss Karen off, and it did. And <laughs> because of that, we didn't get to use the specter in the last arc of the book. We because we thought we were going to have the specter in the last arc, and she was like, "No, I forbid it." And we had to make up a new character to take the Spectre's parts. <laughs> okay. Um, here is a panel of uh, Don Roberto, yet again the gentleman uh, with the fishbone shirt. And in the bottom left corner, he's a reader of Vogue, Our Bodies and Ourselves, and Hustler. <laughs> <laughs> I, what kind of person is Don Roberto to have this literature? I think we just wanted to. I think we just wanted to make that kind of make them contrarian, you know, because our bodies ourselves is like it's sort of like a feminist bible, and the hustlers totally off. <laughs> so and Vogue is too, for that matter. But yeah, we just. I I think we wanted to get away from. You know, there's sort of this magical primitive character that pops up a lot in fiction, you know, like the white man loses his way and then like that some native person who's in touch with nature comes and leads him out. And we wanted Don Roberto to not be that cliche. We wanted him to be a smart ass and like up on pop culture and you know, he's playing video games and you know, he's not he's just not this one way to make like three dimensional character. And then also to make him a little bit of a trickster. So we were throwing stuff like that in one. OK. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to own this uh, original page. And I actually got it from Phil. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, Swamp Thing uh, pages. Um, it, to me, it feels like it goes back to 
the uh, Swamp Thing, uh, Alan Moore, Gotham City, uh, Batman encounter. When they meet up in Gotham City, and Swamp Thing threatens to, to uh, he can control all plant material, so he can control all plant material in your body. So he can basically rip you in half in the blink of an eye. And what he threatens in Gotham City, I feel like Phil gave us what would have happened. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about, like, like the, not so much, I guess, this page, but like the process of you drawing this and like the story and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, that's Mark. I mean, everybody knows Mark Miller knows that his, like, his gift as a writer is to turn into a lemon, right? And so, like, anything that Alan would hint at, Mark's like, well, why didn't we do that? <laughs> Let's just show it. Um, and yeah, he's he was always looking to push that shock button and, and make it a true horror look again. And so having Swamp Thing do horrible things uh, when he was out of his right mind yeah. was was part of it. And what I remember from this book was um, there's a lot of Zipatone on this. And you, for all you youngsters that don't know what Zipatone is, um, it's how we used to get half tones in comics. We used to, there used to be this like sticky film that had little dot, dot makers <laughs> on it. And we used to cut it out and like actually paste it on the page where we wanted that half tone to show up. And if you paste it over itself, you get these, these weird patterns like you see in the Swan Pig figure that are actually called moires. And that comes from having two little dot matrices kind of fall on top of each other. But we wanted to show that Swamp Thing encased in ice, you know, you wouldn't see him on as like an all black form. Instead, we, we did it with the Zipatone. So that's what I really remember from this page. And also that the panels kind of reflect also the fissures in the ice, you know. So that was like my little story telling it. I should say right now, that I'm like, I'm not a big fan of my run on Swamp Thing artistically. I'm a big fan of Swamp Thing, but I'm not a big fan of what I did. I was in my mid 20s and probably wasn't ready for the gig, but I was so anxious to do it that I said yes and I, I gave it my all, but I'd sure like to go back now and redraw every one of those pages. I think all of us would love that. <laughs> um, all right, I think, uh, let's see. Now we can open up to questions if anyone has any questions for Phil or any questions regarding Swamp Thing at all. Anybody? Yeah, he knows more than me. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? What point in the art would you exaggerate? Uh, I, I see a lot of your, uh, when you're Swamp Thing, I see a lot of your regular human form characters, well, form. I mean, they're just recognized as human. So what would you exaggerate to draw Swamp Thing? Swamp Thing's always stooped over. Like, even when he's standing erect, he's kind of hunched. So he's got a super huge rib cage and super huge shoulders and kind of a hunched back and really thick, like, old neck. Um, and that's sort of the And his arms are really too long. Um, and those are the things I exaggerate. But I think if you go if you go through and you look at how every artist handles him, they all draw him in different ways. Like if you look at Kelly Jones, he does really, like, distended rib cages, you know, like really high contrast rib cages and Bernie Wrightson's is probably still the thickest one thing. You know, he's really big and bulky. He even has a pot belly, you know, when Bernie draws him. Um, so everybody that, that again, he's like like I said, he's like Batman. He's it's such a bulletproof design that it can withstand so many takes and still be recognizable as the character it is. John, what surprise was actually in your collection? That's a tough one, uh, but it would have to be uh, between a few. Uh, I have uh, a watch from uh, Dick Durock's estate, and it's uh, it's a pr promo watch that they made in very limited quantities, but he would give out uh, when he would meet fans and stuff like that. And uh, when he passed away, when he passed away, I was able to, to get a watch from, I think it was some auction or something like that that someone purchased and I got it off him. And then the other stuff would probably be the um, I've, uh, I've accumulated a few Indonesian uh, pressings or editions, and I have a contact over there, and he said that it's extremely diff difficult to get editions printed over there. It's, there's just no demand, and there isn't any money to go into it. And so you'll get a lot of almost like folk art of people 
reinterpreting uh, these like classic stories and so like those African movie posters yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so like so in fact I have some downstairs if you guys want to see them but uh, so in like some panels he's like this like muddy orange and it just it just doesn't make sense and some is like brown and they don't really stay true to form but just to see that reinterpretation is like awesome mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Whichever. Yeah. <laughs> Let's run the I'm trying to get it off. It be a memorable panel. Yeah. <laughs> In the back, go ahead. Ragman. Right. Is anybody surprised by that? It's right. And he's also green somehow. I do like Brother Power, but I, I do like all the weird superheroes. But it, of the the weird weirdos, probably Ragman and Robot Man and Dead Man. Everything. Yes. Do Do Patrol. Yeah. But I do I do like. You know, I do like the gold major about me too. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> right. Ra I got right. I wanted to draw Ragman so bad I threw him in the background. Mm -hmm. of the, the swan thing. Yeah. <laughs> but did you have a question? Oh yeah, I was just wondering. Uh, several years ago, during the Brightness Day, and they were using the swan thing in the DC universe, and they were being more for a pocket universe. There were I don't know. There's well, I'll let John talk about it, but I, I know from like my perspective, everybody who worked at BC and Virgo thought the wall between BC and Virgo was stupid. Like we all wanted Batman to be able to punch John Constantine. You know, we all wanted, you know, Swamp Thing to be able to scare the Justice League, you know. Because the, all those vertical books started in the DCU, and it seemed kind of dumb to like then cut them off. And it it seemed almost like a like a denying your roots. Like, oh, we're grown up comics now. We don't have anything to do with those dumb comics. And I think what's what's beautiful about comics is it's sort of it's sort of this kind of bastard art form that you know, like. We don't have to be respectable, and in some ways that frees us, you know, to do whatever we want. So no one's thinking about like, um, you know, how this is going to play in a gallery, or who's going to say what about this in our weekly. You know, we we just we're sort of like the punk rock of our, you know, we just do our thing and not and don't care. And so kind of denying that those groups seem like very not punk to most artists. And my, I guess my take on that is, uh, like Phil was saying earlier, uh, being almost bulletproof, uh, I have such heavy blinders on when anything comes up Swamp Thing that, uh, you know, even if he was in a commercial hawking like Pillsbury Biscuits, I would be so <laughs> excited. Like, I just don't care. Yeah. And, and, like, the, the good work and the stuff that, like, the, the I, I hate to say true fans, that sounds lame, but uh, that stuff like floats higher than others. So if something isn't flying, like, you know, it's going to look great probably. And if it's not great, it's probably not going to stick around. Um, but as time is told, it just he keeps coming back. And sometimes I'm kind of confused by that. For instance, the new run, I appreciate the heck out of it, but I do think it's really odd that you would cancel a book and then bring it back in less than a year yeah, because right of poor, yeah, yeah, because of poor sales. It's like, what? Like, I don't know. It's just yeah. so strange. John, did you like the little mirror run? Yeah, yeah. There was, there was parts that I I thought was a little odd, like just in terms of like how he, his character and abilities were portrayed, but yeah, it, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I just think you, you almost had to read that along with the Animal, animal Man series. It just, I really enjoyed that. It's probably been my favorite since, well, since Miller. Oh. Uh -huh. And yeah, I, I love that run, man. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. The, mysticism, the mystic side versus the horror side. There was a pretty deep horror between the Animal Man and that too, and then it was in this new bright and shiny 
DC was really dark. Yeah. Medium high quarter was awesome. I was really blown away when the new 52 started back up and the whole rock green thing was going on. And it wasn't under vertigo. And there is one panel that like burned in my mind. And it's, I'm sure you guys remember, the, there's a like a whole, uh, an airplane full and uh, there's a grandmother and child on this plane. And the little kid looks out the window to say something and he turns back and I think his grandmother's rotting away. And then like, he's like, grandma! And she like pulls his mouth open and like, I mean, they all die. I'll just leave it at that. But like, when, when, yeah, when I read that, I was like, how, how is this just on the shelf? Like, it was really cool to see, but I was really shocked that they're just like, oh, no, this is a DC book. And it's like, no, they shouldn't be picking this up. Have you seen Batman versus Superman? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? No, I was a fan. I, I, the fandom is what made me become. I mean, I guess I, I always liked to draw and write when I was a very young kid. But what made me get serious about it was comics. At about age twelve or thirteen, that's when I, you know, was like, yeah, maybe I can do this for a living. You know, maybe I can be one of these people whose names I see in the credit box. And yeah, that's what made me get serious about it. But. You know, all through art school, I I sort of stayed open to the idea of maybe doing other things, you know, being being a fine artist or going into animation. And I I do have a fine art style that's completely different from my comic book style. Um, it's a, little, a lot more abstracted, but it, um, no, comics is what made me an artist. Bill, you reference music a lot. Um, in previous panel, uh, the story we were talking about, you know, rock and roll. Yeah. And then you throw in the official stuff to me, and I, I did that. I worked for producer next year, <coughs> right from the record label, and then Phonogram, one of my new favorites that I found in the local music is Disney. <coughs> did you find yourself trying to weave that mysticism of music and then the magic of that into? Your, your art or you no. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, 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 it was just me trying to give a shout out to bands that I like, you know, and because I was doing it on every book I did because there was a lot of graffiti. There used to be a lot more graffiti in the world when we were younger. And uh, every time I did graffiti, I'd always like try to throw a band in that I really liked. So that's basically all that was. Being 25, that's what I meant. <laughs> Aaron? Uh, so, Phil, if you were put in charge of a new Swamp Thing line, Aaron. what kind of take on the character would you promote? And assuming you couldn't do both, would you choose to write or draw? Boy, that's tough. <laughs> Gee whiz. Uh, <laughs> both, both, both. <laughs> well, I would like to do both. Um, but if I just had to write it, I would, I would try to get. I, Either Gerardo Zafino, um, who's um, the son of the late great Zafino, I would try to get him to draw, or uh, James Heron. I think James Heron draws great monsters. Um, or maybe even Aaron Conley. You know, Aaron Conley draws saber tooth swordsman. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah, it was really far out. I mean, it would be really a crazy choice. Or um, I think Becky Clinton's also. Draws good monsters, and I, I really consider Becky Clooney. She's probably at the top for like most games, actually. I think she draws everything pretty well. Would you choose to write over to draw? Um, only because it's easier, but I would still <laughs> like I would still like to draw some of it. Yeah, and, and as far as the take, I would do. I would, you know, everybody has this like a run that's emblematic to them, and for a lot of people, it's the Alan Moore run or the Mark Miller run. Or whatever, but for me, it's always going to be that Wayne and Wright's run, that first run. So I would, I would really depower him and sort of get him back to being a monster and be, really being mad about being in his body, because that's that's at the core of the character. Everybody, to some degree, everybody's mad about the body they're in. I think, you know, even if you're even even if you're a super athlete and you're fit, you're sort of 
mad about your mortality. And if you're not fit, if you're weakened by disease, or if you're obese, you're sort of, you feel trapped by your body. And I think that's at the core of the character, being trapped in your body. Yeah. Kind of back to the music thing. Have you ever actually been commissioned to do any of the artwork, like any, any band, like cover art? Or anything? I'm trying to think about that. I think I have at one point, but I forgot. I don't want to pull a Stan Lee on you, but I've been doing this for I've been doing this for a really long time, so I, I do forget things once in a while. But I, yeah. Well, I, actually, the a little bit of the opposite of that, the the band um, plot things we were talking about before. Um, I did a book called Bone Shaker a long time ago about a professional wrestler that gets, it's actually, I did it before Galaxy Quest, everybody. But it was about aliens who abducted a wrestler because they saw his mic work. I was talking about being the toughest human being on Earth. And these aliens are like, oh damn, he's the toughest. Let's go get him to fight our war for us. Anyway, so it's a bit about this George, basically this George the Animal Steel kind of wrestler who, who has to live out the rest of his life on the alien planet. And um, Platanes actually did a soundtrack for it, which was pretty cool. Anybody else have a question? Were you able to meet um, other artists at the vertical um, office, like like anybody you've worked on, like this role or something? Yeah, yeah, we you kind of meet everybody. It's a really small community, and um, it's he he asked if I've met any other vertigo artists, and yeah, eventually you meet them all. And it's kind of it's what's cool and scary about being in comics is you'll get to meet your heroes. And, you know, <laughs> some of them are some of them turn out to be really cool, and some of them don't. But the good thing is, I think for me at least, the cool ones have outweighed the the jerks by quite a quite a large margin. Um, but for me, the scariest thing was meeting Bernie Robinson. I met, I met Bernie uh, while I was the artist of Swamp Thing. And I had no idea what he felt about you know, my work, or if, he, or if he was angry about Swamp Thing in DC in general, or, you know. But he was really gracious. And it was at a time when he had stopped doing Swamp Thing sketches for people. but. He did one for me since I was the artist with one thing, which was really sweet of him. Yeah, he's one of my heroes. Anybody else? Yeah. Do you ever go through and look at people, like the unofficial artists, and artists, and see what their takes on the Oh, yeah. I mean, I see a lot of people bring me their work at shows, you know, bring me portfolios to look at. Um, but it is cool, just like a lot of like really interesting takes on existing characters you'll find on DeviantArt and other places like that. So yeah, it's a, you, if, if you're interested in just seeing different voices, it's a good place to go. Anybody else have a question? I, I, okay, I, I have one. Um, so this, is, this might sound nitpicky, but why does Swamp Thing have teeth? <laughs> that, is a, that is a great question, and I thought about that a lot, actually. And I, I thought, are, are these bones? Are these what's left of Alan Holland underneath here? And they're not. It's yeah. adult teeth. Or yeah. <laughs> or are these rocks? You know, but they're so white. You know, that I don't, what it boils down to is they look cool. Yeah. And if they didn't look cool, we couldn't do it. So, yeah. It's like, how does Batman see through those blank eyes? Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's cool, that's why it's there. Why, why, is Hawkman, why does Hawkman make giant wings out of it? You know, it's, you know, is it metal? It's magic metal, because it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know?